Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiseter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a patient who attended with bilateral, deeply impacted hardened earwax and the root cause of this impaction was because the patient had been using cotton swabs. Um, and this is despite the patient on two previous occasions attending the clinic uh, with a similar issue where they had really impacted wax because they had used cotton birds. Um, I did advise them not to, uh, but as you can see, um, they went against my advice. And um, it was uh, quite painful for the patient because they had pushed this right up against their eardrum. And we're just performing the procedure in their left ear first. Uh, both ears are quite narrow, but in particular this ear. And you can be Begin to see the floor of the ear canal there. I'm lifting the wax plug up. Now, this is a bit of a challenge it, it, because it, um, the plug was quite a large one and the ear canal is quite narrow. It really compacted deep in the ear and there was a lot of pressure um, on the side of the ear canal walls because of the size of the plug. So this had essentially been squashed in here. It shouldn't really fit, um, but it had been really lodged. And you can see that the wax is extremely dark it's almost um, pitch black, so we know it's been there for a while. It's oxidized, freshly secreted wax is more of a, a lighter brown shade. And as the wax matures and ages, it oxidizes and it turns darker in complexion. Um, and occasionally I've got, hopefully one I'll upload tomorrow or the day after, where the earwax is completely jet black. So that had been there for a while. I'm ha I've had some really interesting cases over the last couple of weeks. Um, I think there's a couple of keratosis optrans I uploaded last week. I had another one today. Um, they were referred by a colleague of mine uh, in the east of England. So they travelled a fair distance to visit and it was a complex case. Uh, the patient was in excruciating pain and they had a grade 2 keratosis optran. So I will try and upload that as well um, during the course of the week or over the, the weekend. I had another case um, yesterday where a patient had some crusted uh, blood uh, lodged right up against the eardrum and there was swelling in front of that and when you have crusted dried blood it's razor sharp around the edges it's almost like a shard of glass and the fact that it was lodged behind the swelling as well made it extremely challenging to remove we did get there in the end so yeah it's been an interesting uh, couple of weeks um, so I'm just trying to roll this wax plug down, if anything, at the moment. I'm going to the top of it and I'm giving it a little wriggle, as you can see. I'm just trying to break down uh, the size of this plug. So if I can break, chisel it down almost, it'll be easier to remove. And I, I don't know whether I've used the hook already, but I did try and use a hook to get into the wax plug. But because there's no opening on the sides, uh, the wax plug... Um, wasn't phased by the ear hook, so I uh, retreated with the earwax hook, came back out, and you can see I'm slowly manipulating this wax plug forward. I've just put a bit more oil just to help lubricate the sides of the ear canal, give it, give some, um, to, to minimize friction and provide some lubrication. And it will also just help to soften the surface of the wax plug to help me get a better suction grip. Just slowly but surely bringing it forwards and then I'm pretty sure if memory serves me correct I almost roll this forwards from the roof you shall see now stay tuned because the left ear is actually even more difficult than this now if this wax plug was really soft it would have been a lot easier to remove because as you're suctioning uh, you get small pieces of wax that break away but because this is, a, this is only going to come out in a single large piece, um, so we're having to bring it out in its entirety. There's a few hairs there, um, so we've got some matted wax. And that's an, also an indication that the patient has been poking in the ears. So these hairs that you're seeing, they should normally be located on the outer third. Some of these hairs, obviously, over time can fall out, but because they're near the entrance, they normally come out of the ear by themselves and if they're deeper in the ear these loose hairs generally have been pushed in unless you trim the hairs 
around your ears um, and what can happen in that case is that the hairs fly loose inwards so a good little tip if you do trim the hairs around your tragus or on the, on the entrance of your ear just place a bit of cotton wool uh, at the entrance create a seal you don't push it in the ear just seal the entrance and you can trim away and they will prevent um, the hairs from flying in hopefully so at the base of the ear canal you may have just seen i positioned the suction probe there and there was very little room for maneuver there so that gives you an indication of how narrow the patient's ear canal is at the base at the floor it's around 2.2 millimeters and we know that because the outer diameter of the zona suction probe is 2.1 millimeters now, it may not look like i've made much progress but uh, appearances can be deceptive and i have actually started to bring the wax book forward and this is where I used the, the well, try to use it, um, the wax hook. I'm just trying to get into the lateral canal wall, dig into the core. And it was actually quite difficult using the hook in this patient's ear because of how narrow the ear canal was and the location, because it was medial. So, on the bony part of the ear, we're going to be more gentle and careful because the, the bony part of the ear canal is far more sensitive than the outer third portion of the ear canal, the cartilage portion. Now, although the hook didn't necessarily bring any wax out, it did break the surface down into smaller pieces. So you can see um, I managed to remove a bit of wax there. Um, it'd be difficult to use forceps because there's nothing for me to really grab onto with forceps. You need something to grab onto and the forceps will actually, I'll be probably not even able to insert the, uh, even the micro forceps into this patient's ear given how narrow it is so it's been very difficult to use it in this case and i'm just trying to squeeze this through i think i'm making some progress now or should i say more marked progress and this is that uh, I, I made reference to it earlier when i'm rolling the wax plug down so i'm leveraging it down and as you're rolling it forwards of course you're bringing it forwards Sometimes it's a good technique to deploy. It can uh, make contact with the roof of the ear canal, but I generally find the roof of the ear canal is a bit more elastic and there's less uh, uh, discomfort in that region if you make contact with it. So we're using that to our advantage here. I think it's just blocked the suction probe and it's just got a bit smeary, so it's just come out of the ear. So I've rolled it probably halfway forwards. And now that the wax plug is realigned, I'm just going back to the core. I'm going to try and lift this off the floor of the ear canal. And you can see a piece breaking away here. And that piece is a bit larger than I first envisioned, so I'm just trying to keep hold of it. When you've got really hard and dry ear wax it's a bit more tricky to get a suction grip the surface is too rough too dry so that's where the oil sometimes helps it softens the surface you can get a better suction grip so i'm making these little wriggle movements and as i am i'm bringing it forward so a piece of wax broke off there but every time i'm breaking away a piece of wax the, i'm making the plug smaller and as it's smaller you can see what i'm doing here i can then fold the outer edges of the wax towards the core uh, make it more compact, make the plug smaller so I can reel it through. And I'm just about squeezing it through, which is great. And there were moments where the patient, I wouldn't say found it uncomfortable, but they were aware that I was in the ear and that's because the surface of this wax plug was very um, rough, very jagged. It's almost like sandpaper, so it can rub the side of the ear canals. That's the patient's eardrum in the distance. Now we've got some wax all around the edge. It is crusted wax. It's embedded against the canal. So I'm going to try and remove as much of this as I can. But we are on the bony part of the ear canal. And again, maybe this view illustrates how narrow the patient's ear canal is. It's, they've got a very, the height of the ear canal would say is, it, it's within normal range. But it's the width that's really um, constricted, uh, which leaves less room for me to uh, enter the ear with the with the endoscope and also to manipulate 
you know, the social pyramid. It's quite a bendy year, actually, when you, when you when I look back at it. The main thing is the eardrums nice and healthy, so I'm just going to the posterior canal wall. This, ear, this portion of the ear canal is slightly tender. You can you may see the, the ears slightly more red and a tad swollen here. I think I've just decided to get this more lateral crusted skin wax out first. Just put some more in and I think I was standing up for this part. I was looking down into the ear and I'm slowly peeling this away. And here's that valley, that very narrow valley. And even with the fine end, it only just fits there. And now we're on the bony part, so we're going to be more gentle. You can normally tell the boundary between the cartilage portion and the bony part. The cartilage portion generally the skin is a bit paler and the skin that lines the bony portion is a bit more red, a bit more pink. That's because the blood vessels are more exposed because the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal is extremely thin. It's around 0.1 millimetres in thickness, whereas the skin that lines the, the, uh, the, the cartilage portion, the outer third, the skin's one millimetres in thickness. So the blood vessels are more exposed and more visible, hence why. There's a slight difference in, in tone and complexion. So I think I'm going to bend the tip of the fine end in a minute just to get a better angle. Now, of course, we can leave this. It's not really going to improve their symptoms, but I felt comfortable. The patient was comfortable. And um, sometimes the more you get out, uh, it just... Patients feel more satisfied. Now, that's uh, quite often patients do put a bit of pressure on me if I've left a bit of wax in, in a certain area where I don't feel comfortable removing. And I've got to explain that to the patient where I don't want to risk removing a piece of wax. Um, that's non-significant. It's in a very tender part of the ear, for example. Um, so we decide to leave that. And you can see there's a bit of leftover. I've just decided to, to leave that because I, I figured if I try and remove it anymore, I'm just potentially going to cause trauma. So sometimes less is more, but um, everything I around the edges that I felt comfortable removing without risking any trauma, I managed to do that. So now the right side, the wax um, consistency is slightly different. It's not as dry and hard. It's a bit more um, sticky and glutinous and mushy. And I, although it took me a bit longer and, um, to remove the wax plug on the left side, I would much prefer that consistency to this consistency. This is a bit more like chewing gum. And once more, the patients poked it and pushed it right up against the radar, making it really difficult. Um, their left ear was the worst in terms of symptoms. And this ear wasn't as uncomfortable for the patient as their left side. But it, it, that, that's not to say that it's not, that it was comfortable. Um, whenever you push wax up against the eardrum, it's going to be slightly um, uncomfortable for you. As you can imagine, you're, pressure, you're applying pressure on the on an eardrum, which is about 0.1 millimetres in thickness or 0.2 millimetres in thickness, that's pushed up against the hammer bone. Um, that can push the ossicular chain, so all the bones, the ossicles, the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup. You apply pressure on the eardrum, you're actually um, moving all the bones as well because they're all interconnected. Now again, it's really narrow here. Uh, I think I'm using the fine end already, and even the fine end looks quite big inside the patient's ear canal. I've just put loads of oil in there. You can actually see the mark where they've indented the wax plug with the cotton bud. The, where I am now, the roof of the ear canal, that wax is more lateral, it's protruding outwards, and just below that, you can see an arc, and that's the indentation of the cotton swab. So that wax is more deeper, more medial. See, it's slowly but surely coming away, and it's going to be patient with this one, as I don't know exactly at this stage where the eardrum is, so I'm proceeding with caution. Now I can see the eardrum, so it's actually a bit closer than I envisaged. I thought there'll be the wax plug will be a bit thicker and there'll be a bit more room. So if I went in gung-ho, there's a good chance that I've actually made contact with the patient's eardrum as I'm inserting the suction probe. So at first, uh, with a procedure like this, I just want to um, gather my bearings. Uh, um, it's not always about removing the wax all the time. It's about working to achieve that. And 
I just want to see the patient's eardrum first. Now, even at this stage, the patient can hear significantly better because, of course, the sound can get through, but naturally I want to remove more for them. And now I've got a better gorge, or should I say gauge, of exactly where we are, um, how close the eardrum is to the wax. And I'm using the fine end. I'm just, you can see how impacted this is. I'm slowly rolling it down. So that's another technique I'm deploying on, on a smaller scale, mind you, in, in this patient's right ear. So we can see the back part of the ear canal. The wax on the left, that's not actually on the eardrum. That's just thinly lining the canal wall. And I, I've left that in the end. The patient did get a bit, um, experienced a bit of nausea and vertigo due to the caloric effect. When you vacuum the ear, it actually removes the, the temperature of the ear. And on each of our ears, we've got the vestibular system, which is the organ of balance, and it consists of um, three semicircular canals that are connected to the, um, it's connected to the, the balance aspect of the eighth cranial nerve, known as the, well, it's got several names, the co cochlear vestibular nerve or the auditory nerve, and that sends signals to the brain. And when you vacuum the ear, you actually reduce the ear temperature, and that uh, it, uh, then has a knock-on effect on the organ of balance. It reduces its function, it inhibits in fu its function. So the brain is receiving less signals at this stage in the right ear compared to the left, which tricks the brain into believing you're moving towards your left side. And your eyes then try and correct your brain, and we experience vertigo, feeling the room spinning around. And it settles after a few minutes. After All I need to do is come out of the ear with the suction pro, let the ear re return to its normal temperature and they feel a bit better but um, accompanying vertigo you can sometimes experience nausea so a feeling of feeling sick or I've had one patient I think a couple of years ago physically felt sick um, the, the bathroom and the sink was too far so yeah, they had to go out the side of the front door and they just about made it um, so that was a bit of an experience so the eardrum's fully visible I'm just going to mop up as much as I can on the safer regions Again, I'm going to leave that back part because it is a sensitive region. It's right on the bone. It's just a thin veneer, and I, I dare not make contact with that. And I think by that stage, the patient was a bit slightly nauseous, a bit of vertigo. Another reason why you can sometimes experience vertigo when you remove wax, if you've got a, a really uh, embedded plug like this patient did, especially on the eardrum, as you release the plug off the eardrum, you can actually pull the eardrum forwards a bit which alters the middle ear pressure. And any change in pressure um, can lead to, um, again, the caloric effect. So it can um, disrupt the signals from the organ of balance to the brain, which can trick our brains into believing that we're moving, uh, but we're not. Then your eyes try and correct your brain, and there we have it, we experience vertigo. So vertigo is actually a symptom, it's not a condition. Uh, I think sometimes, Maybe it was, there was that movie, wasn't there, called Vertigo, but people associate vertigo with a fear of heights. That's not necessarily true. Vertigo's um, medical uh, definition is the sensation of the room spinning around you or vice versa, uh, you spinning around the room. Um, and a fear of heights can lead to vertigo. So vertigo is more of a symptom uh, as opposed to a condition. So a lot of patients advise that they were diagnosed with, with vertigo. And so I, don't know, uh, I asked the following question, do they, know, do they know the condition that caused the vertigo? Um, because there's many different balance conditions, like uh, BPPV, which is an acronym for B9 positional proximal vertigo. That's when we have some calcium carbonate crystals within the organ of balance that become dislodged and they move from one semicircular canal to another where they shouldn't be. It normally happens when you lay down and turn over to the side. Um, you can get vertigo for a minute or so, accompanied with, um, with nausea. And if you look at the, your eyes, which you won't be able to do yourself, but if someone is looking at your eyes, you get um, this rotary nystagmus. Your eyes rotate. It can be a bit scary at first. The first time I saw it, um, I wasn't prepared for it. So that's BPPV. Um, so if you if you if you get if you experience vertigo when you lay back and turn over to one side, and it lasts for about a minute, or for example if you're in the kitchen you put you tilting your head upwards and into one side, 
slightly that you got BPPV, and there is a procedure called um, the Epley maneuver. And the, uh, there are other tests as well, the log roll. So it's see a GP, see uh, an audiologist, and they'll be able to help you. Then you can get um, Menyes. Menyes is got a few names: um, endolymphatic hydrops. It's a buildup of endolymph fluid within, which is one of the inner ear fluids, and it can either be caused by um, a hyperactive endolymphatic gland or a blockage of the endolymphatic um, duct where it can drain and that can cause a pressure buildup, uh, pressure feeling in the ear and it's normally accompanied by tinnitus, um, a fullness sensation in the ear and a temporary reduction in the ear and when you get about typically about four or five hours you can experience vertigo. You can also experience a sudden drop attack with, with Meniere's um, and you can suffer from it for a few days and then it clears and it kind of comes back again. It's almost seasonal. Um, after a Menier's attack, your hearing generally goes back to normal, but over time it can stop returning back to normal. I'll talk a bit more about um, some balance conditions in the next video, so I'll keep a log of... I've talked about BPPV and Menier's already. So that's the, the wax plugs that are removed. You can see how dark the top one was. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.